My name is Tamara Staten, if you don't know me, and as CCL's Regional Coordinator for the Greater Pacific Northwest, as well as Education and Resilience Coordinator, I am excited to welcome you to our regional forum on advanced nuclear energy. This forum will explore new technology, nuclear power plants, specifically those that will be constructed in Washington State and Wyoming. The US Department of Energy issued contracts last fall to private companies X Energy and Terra Power to demonstrate the technologies in partnership with the Department of Energy. We will look at the technical differences from existing nuclear power plants in terms of safety, material disposal, weapons proliferation, construction costs, and habitat impact. We will also review the impact of climate policies, including carbon fee and dividend, on the deployment of nuclear energy. So before I introduce our speakers for this evening and then dive into the content that you've come to digest, let me make a few points of housekeeping. So all lines have been muted and will remain muted throughout the evening until we get to the optional discussion section in breakout rooms. But like I have said, please introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're calling in from if you would like to. We will be taking questions through the chat during the Q&A section, as opposed to having people unmute and um, speak your questions. So please keep your questions succinct enough for us to follow and then read aloud. And Steve will do his best to um, absorb your questions and to share as many of your questions as possible with our speakers. But we may not be able to get to all of your questions and we will share options for how to get your remaining questions answered um, at the end of the evening, as well as um, towards the end of the presentation. If you do have tech needs, we are un going to be unable to help you with those because we're going to be sharing about nuclear, but I will say, I will drop some tech information in the chat if you need to go there. This event is being recorded and will be emailed to all attendees as soon as possible at the address associated with their registration. And in addition, we'll send a few follow-up materials in that email as well. If you're new or newer to Zoom or could use a refresher, let me get rid of this over here. Um, I put some pieces on the, some points on the screen. So we've got in gallery or speaker view in the upper right-hand corner, which allows you to toggle between seeing just the speakers or seeing everyone all together. The raise hand feature is under reactions towards the bottom of your screen, which can be found um, next to the chat. Um, all right, I also wanna share a brief set of group agreements that we've created for this evening to help us have a wonderful educational evening together. We are an online community right here, right now on this call. And we hope to create that feeling throughout the evening. It energizes us to hear from you, to know what you want, what you care about. And at the same time, we request and encourage you to share respectfully, to be open to learning, to keep your comments succinct, both in the chat and in the breakout room discussions and allow space for others and their perspectives. Keeping in mind that one of our CCL values at CCL is relationships. I do want to mention while I'm on the topic of CCL values that CCL is neutral on nuclear. We are agnostic about the forms of energy that, um, that are in play. So while we advocate for carbon pricing, we do not advocate specifically for nuclear. And I just want to make that very clear that tonight is intended to be an educational and instructional event. So if you are up for following these community group agreements this evening, go ahead and let us know that in the chat with a rip roaring. Let's do this. And while you are doing that, I am going to share the agenda for this evening. Right now you are experiencing the welcome and introduction. And then we are going to dive into how does nuclear generate electricity? We will then have a brief Q&A about the basics of nuclear and then dive into the more specific aspects of advanced nuclear around X Energy's high temp gas reactor and Terra Power's natrium sodium fast reactor, the SFR. Then we will look more at the economics of nuclear power and carbon pricing and how that relates to what we advocate for in CCL. We'll have a brief um, Q&A around 
that aspect. And then for those that want to dive into deeper questions or into more of a discussion topic, then we have optional breakout rooms. We have a general open discussion with myself and Sarah Kate. Uh, Pro-nuclear constituents will be with Jim and then technology and hazard will be with Kurt. So with that, I believe that I'm going to stop my share and pass it over to you, Kurt. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Excellent. You're welcome. Let me hit some buttons here. Looking good. Okay, great. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kurt Smith Peters. I'm with the uh, Port Orchard, Washington chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, happy to be here tonight and talk a little bit about advanced nuclear energy technology. There's some exciting new uh, technology development going on. Uh, recent contracts have been awarded. There's a plan to build a new type of nuclear energy plant in Tri-Cities, Washington State, as well as at a site in Wyoming. Somebody had asked to chat about Bill Gates. So the, the Wyoming site is the one that Bill Gates' company, Terra Power, is working on. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how just basics about nuclear energy, how it works generally, uh, and then get into talking a little bit how these, these new technologies are different and, and what it is they're trying to, to test out and, and prove out. Okay, first of all, let me get my mouse working here. All right, so anyway, so um, basically how does nuclear work? It uses a lot of, uh, it, it plugs in a new heat source to ways that we've generated energy for some time. So, so it works something like an old steam engine, um, but with a different source of heat. So just looking at that, that steam engine there. So, so step one is they're burning some kind of fuel, wood or coal, that's generating the heat. Uh, step two, there is a, there's uh, water inside pipes that, that heat uh, is uh, acting on those pipes, heating up that water, it turns to steam. The steam is uh, a higher pressure um, when the water converts to steam and that pressure can be used as a force to do some work. In the case of a train, there's a there's a little piston thing down here in the left, number three, and the steam is uh, has valves that push it to one side or the other, moves the piston back and forth, and that drives the wheels around. Uh, in a nuclear energy plant, uh, similar, instead of the piston, there uh, that steam under pressure is operating on a on a turbine, and which is like a hydroelectric dam. And I've got that little picture of the inside of a hydroelectric dam over on the right side. Um, only instead of water hitting on the turbine blades, there's the steam, uh, the heated pressurized steam turns the blades and that turns a generator. A generator is basically a coil of wires, electric wires that's turning through a magnetic field, just like a normal magnet. And that generates, uh, that makes the electrons move in the wires and creates the electricity that we use. So, so nuclear is similar using uh, different types of technology, but plugging in a new heat source. Hopefully everybody remembers their uh, steam train days. Maybe I'm older. Um, so a second, I gotta, just a minute here. Wow, this, let's see. okay, there, got rid of it. So anyway, um, so some basics on how nuclear generates he heat. Uh, so, so down at the molecular level, uh, very small atoms, molecules, uh, uranium is a, is a heavy metal uh, that is radioactive and it's prone to certain behavior uh, from that radioactivity. So, when it's used in a power plant, there is uh, initial uh, generation of neutrons, which is a small particle from the atom that, that as you see in this picture over on the left, 
a neutron strikes or collides or comes near to a, a uranium atom, it's captured, it joins the atom, and this causes the atom to become unstable and to quickly split. And when it splits, it generates a lot of heat and more neutrons. Uh, and then those neutrons go and they hit other uranium atoms uh, nearby and cause the same thing to happen. And, and there's a, a lot of heat released each time. And this reaction just grows with, with you know, um, a lot of multiplication and a lot of heat is released. Um, now, that's the basic uh, process uh, is splitting atoms to make heat. And we use that heat for various uses in this case to generate steam. I want to point out there's, there's two kind of uh, uh, ways that that chain reaction uh, two ways that we utilize that chain reaction. We, and we talk about different reactor types of a fast reactor and a thermal reactor. And, and basically the difference is that uh, when the neutrons are released from the splitting or fission of the atoms, they're moving very fast. And there's a tendency of what they call scatter or they're like, like uh, when Minnesota Fats is playing, the, the, the balls bounce off each other and they don't actually split. Um, so there's a couple ways to deal with that technologically. One is in a fast reactor, you'd let them keep going at full speed and you just have a lot of material around it that even though it's bouncing off most of it, there's enough rate, uh, splittable or fissionable material around it that it will cause the reaction to keep going and be maintained. The other way is a thermal reactor. You, you have another material such as water in, in with the reaction and it slows the neutrons down and it makes them more prone to be captured and then cause another uh, split and keeps the chain reaction going that way. Now you may say, why do I care about this? Well, this, this has to do with the way the different technologies operate. And in the case of a fast reactor, there is a much more power generated for the amount of fuel that you use. And, and that's an imp that can be important for, for many reasons, which, which I'll talk about. Okay, next. Now, this is the last slide on atoms, I promise. Um, so really, this, this choice of a thermal or a fast re uh, reactor um, is a way to, these are strategies to deal with the fact that in nature, uh, there's only one naturally occurring material that will uh, maintain a, a nuclear chain reaction, a fission chain reaction, which is uranium-235, and it's the atom that's in the middle here on the left. Um, however, there's only point zero, less than one percent of all uranium naturally occurring is this 235 that will that will naturally maintain a, a nuclear reaction. Uh, it's it lives or it's it's amongst Another uh, element, you, uh, you another isotope, you, uranium 238 at the bottom here, which is 99%. But that type in its natural state will not maintain a chain reaction. So there's a couple of ways to deal with that. One is to enrich the U235. So you go through some processing, you, you throw away some of that U238, and you got a more concentrated mix in it, and you combine that with a moderator and that uh, slows the atoms down and they'll maintain the, the, the splitting chain reaction. Um, that's called a thermal reactor where, where we enrich. The other possibility is conversion. So you can take two other materials that exist in nature, which is thorium-232 at the top or uranium-238 at the bottom. Neither of those will maintain a reaction as they naturally occur in nature. However, if you put them in a fast reactor, those fast, those fast neutrons will convert those atoms and they'll convert them to another material that will sustain a nuclear reaction. So the thorium will be converted to this U233. See, uh, these yellow uh, lightning bolts are indicating the, the nuclear chain reaction. And if you have uranium-238 in a fast reactor, those fast neutrons will convert it to plutonium-239. So, so, so again, there are different strategies to get to a material that will maintain this chain reaction to provide the heat for the energy. But there's a big difference in that if you, 
in one, you're dependent on something that's just 1% of, of the uranium occurring. The other, you have super abundant materials and you can convert those into a, for a small amount of mining, you can, you can utilize, uh, you can basically have a one-for-one -one usage of all that mined material. And so therefore you have a lot more energy produced with less mining and less disposal. And we'll come back and look at that in a little, but I wanted to <laughs> create that basic point. Next topic is the radiation. So when the uranium is mined or processed or transported or when it's being used in a power plant, it does generate radiation. However, not all radiation is harmful. And as a matter of fact, we are living amongst radiation all the time and we probably wouldn't survive without it. Um, and this is a little pie chart over here on the left. We've got uh, radiation coming. This radon and thoron is the, this big tan slice there that, that we're breathing it. It's around us all the time. There's cosmic radiation. Um, and then there's a bunch of medical ra radiation if we're around tests or have scans or things like that. There's a little tiny thing that some people worry a lot about, which is microwaves and cell phones and so on is the consumer piece here. The industrial occupational is a, is a tiny little bit and nuclear is, a, is an even tinier thread in there. So so we've got this level all around us, and, and let's talk about this level in relation to others. So, so the, there's a measurement, and, and I, there, I've got further reading here on the technical details. I'm trying to keep this just some, some basic concepts, and, and we're going to send this out, and you can click on these links and read more details if you want, want to get in it more. But there's a unit of measure called a sievert. Okay, and I'm not going to go into that. There are multiple, many ways that they measure radiation, but that's one of them. And the US average uh, is 6.2 millisieverts per year. That's just from medical tests and radiation from space and so on. Um, in the Fukushima prefecture, after in the year following the tsunami, they measured 3.5 millisieverts per year. So actually less than the average that just normal radiation in the US. Denver has 12.6 average per year. Why? Because they're higher up. So there's, there's less atmospheric uh, reflection of the radiation from space. Kerala in India, on the uh, west coast of India, they, they live on a thorium beach. And so they got 70 uh, milliliters per year. And there's no, no evidence of any health impacts of that whatsoever. So, so these, these smaller normal levels that we're around, um, completely safe. Uh, as far as heart, heart evidence of sickness, we, we've seen cases with nuclear bomb blasts and things like that where people get a, a 500 millisievert per year dose and they, they develop some kind of a radiation sickness from it and even death. Um, <clears throat> However, there's been extrapolation. Uh, there's a theory called linear no, linear no threshold that, that extrapolated from exposures in the early nuclear bombs and bomb testing and some of the, the cases of sickness that resulted from that. And they assume that there's no safe level and they just take a percentage down and then they predict, okay, well, we had this much, this tiny little bit of radiation, therefore we're gonna have this much cancer. Okay, and that has never panned out. Uh, you'll see a lot of estimates of that, but in every case uh, where there's been some release and exposure to medical isotopes and things, uh, we haven't seen those rates pan out. They've been predicted, but they haven't happened. Um, and, and one of the problems of this is that you get the successive evacuation zones around nuclear power plants. And that is a, you know, that's a worry for people um, in, Fukushima, it, it turned out to be deadly when there was uh, evacuation that didn't need to take place and, and elderly people were, were harmed and even killed in the process of evacuation. So that's a, a driver, those big evacuation zones are a driver of radiophobia. And we'll see that that's one of the things that the advanced uh, nuclear is trying to cut that evacuation zone down. Uh, so there are, Boy, the zoom. Uh, there, there is, if you have a, uh, elevated exposure to radiation, it is hazardous. And there's four main ways that one could be um, ex in the process of nuclear 
getting energy from from nuclear uh, reaction. There's there's four different main ways that you could a person could be exposed to excessive dangerous levels of radiation, but we have protocols to deal with all of those. Uh, so the first is that, you know, you could have improper mining, handling, transport, operation, uh, but there is shielding protocols. And if people follow the shielding, shielding protocols, then they're not going to be injured. Uh, we do have, you know, never say never. So there is, you know, there are accidents, there's um, failure to follow protocols, but, but, it, but there's not a technical uh, problem that we don't have the proper protocols or they're unknown. Uh, the secondly is when the material has been fully used, we got all the energy we can get out of it and we're gonna, we're gonna uh, store that spent material somewhere that it may not be contained. It might leak out, go somewhere we don't want and expose someone. So there are solutions for that. It can be put in a dry cask, which is there's pictures at the bottom here. Uh, could be put in a salt formation arguably the most stable because the water is not there to cause corrosion of the container or react with the material. Or there's a possibility of a, a deep rock bore, which they're, uh, they're just uh, starting one of those in Finland currently. Uh, the third way one could be exposed is through a meltdown of a reactor that for some reason overheats, something malfunctions in the nuclear power plant, causes to overheat and that overheating will, can cause other materials to explode. Uh, we saw that at Chernobyl and Fukushima. Um, it, at Chernobyl, the water exploded and at Fukushima, the hydrogen collected and exploded. Um, and then that, that spreads out uh, the nuclear fuel materials from the reactor. Uh, so the answer to that is to design the reactor technology for passive heat removal, meaning that it doesn't take a, a particular a person to push a button. It doesn't take electricity to operate some kind of a, a, a control rod or something, but the, but the inherent design of it, if it starts to overheat, will passively remove that heat. And we're gonna look at some of the, that uh, safety technology in, a, in another slide. The last thing is that a nuclear weapon could explode and, and spread radioactive material in there. The issue uh, is to control pro proliferation. So prevent the, the fuel used for nuclear energy from being proliferated into a weapons program. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So I, I talked about the hazards, but I wanna put those hazards in perspective. First of all, nuclear is the safest uh, energy source we have. Uh, if there's many different measures, but if you measure by mortality rates of, of deaths per trillion kilowatts, um, it's 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 way low. Um, you know, there's more people injured installing solar panels, way more actually, and and uh, wind turbines. So the uh, there is. The, the, re, the, 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 the small amount of uh, sickness that we've had and thus that we've had was uh, in early mining where the protocols weren't fully understood or followed, weapons handling, and, and we had incidents of that uh, radiation uh, sickness at Hanford, Washington uh, in the, uh, where, where the, uh, the new, one of the new nuclear plants is going and, uh, and the Chernobyl meltdown. So we have had those cases um, on the other hand, no one was injured by radiation during the Three Mile Island or Fukushima incidents. Um, disposed nuclear material naturally becomes harmless, so it, eventually all the radiation uh, is emitted and it turns into lead and it, it's non-radioactive. Sometimes that takes hundreds, sometimes that takes thousands of years depending on the isotopes and that, that length that's called a half-life uh, is also something that uh, is different with the advanced nuclear. And the last point is, is all that disposed uh, nuclear fuel from 70 years of generating electricity in the US, it covers a football field, as this illustration shows. And that, and that 70 years of that weight of material of that 70 years of electricity generation is equal to how much coal ash is put out by coal plants every six hours in the US. It's equal to the carbon dioxide output every 45 minutes of coal plants. So we're, so we're talking about a very different scale of material and hazard. Um, okay. Uh, the other point 
uh, on the hazard is the proliferation. Uh, so, so the proliferation uh, is the, the risk of proliferation relates to how easy it is if somebody takes the material, whether it's uh, by government design or by, uh, you know, terrorists or, or some non-government actors, how hard is it, how difficult is it for them to convert that fuel into weapons? And depending on what the fuel type is, and there's some types listed on this table on the left, some are, are relatively easy, it takes some technical acumen, but and some are very, very difficult. So, so the proliferation control is, is related to, is focused on the, on the ones that are a, a, a risk of, of being turned into bomb material. There's a couple different controls on that. If those materials are created in the reactor or they're transported in the fuel before or after being used, uh, one, one approach is the International Atomic Energy Association has a, a whole set of standards that control and track and report, you know, where all this material moves in the world for every, everybody who's generating electricity. And there's another uh, innovation recently of Rosatom, which is the Russian uh, nuclear energy company, and they offer a wound to tomb service where they will come in and uh, bring experts, build the plant for a company, provide the fuel to run, help them run the plant, and then they'll take the fuel away, take it back to Russia, and they will burn it in one of these fast reactors to, to convert that material to more energy and, and then dispose of it. So, so it's really quite a, an improvement for, for proliferation control. Uh, China has recently said they're going to offer the same service, and I think U.S. and others will. If they get in, big in the export market, we'll do the same thing. Um, so, yeah. So, so oh, the, my last point here was that the other possibility is just don't create those, those isotopes, those, those forms of uranium uh, that are susceptible be, to be made in the bombs. And their strategies that we'll see in these advanced nuclear reactors where they, their strategy is to burn and convert away from those types of the, the red materials there while it's still in the reactor so that it, so there, you know, if somebody could get it out of the reactor, that's not too easy. And once it, once it's done and leaves the reactor, those materials, those particular isotopes don't exist anymore or very small percent. So next point is the, the climate impact, which is of course what a lot of us are, are here for and concerned about. So nuclear is a, a, a very low, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitter, carbon emitter. It does not emit any greenhouse gases during operation. If you see this chart down on the bottom here, you'll you'll see that you know the nuclear is right there along with wind, solar, hydro, and so, so on. That you know very compared to the fossil fuel emissions per per amount of electricity is it's quite small. Um, now that's that's the uh, in theory, I guess, but in practice, what we've seen so far, only hydroelectric and nuclear have decarbonized electricity generation in particular regions. And the reason is that uh, because so far, the addition of intermittent energy like solar and wind has, re has required some sort of a backup for downtime. And so far, that backup has been filled mainly by fossil fuels. Um, so you've got this ironic situation that's counterintuitive that we're adding on in some places, Germany, for example, California, we're adding on more capacity of intermittent energy, but we're actually having car, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions rise. Um, and that's a, you know, it's just, that's a technical problem we're going to have to work through, and, and uh, I will come back to that later. Um, just to look at some comparisons on this map, you know, France, which is nuclear and hydro, is, is 40. 40, uh, uh, yeah, some uh, greenhouse gas grams, grams of greenhouse ga gas equivalent per kilowatt of electricity produced, sorry. And Germany's 200, so uh, five times more. Uh, California is 10 times the greenhouse gas emissions per uh, kilowatt of electricity, or in this case, megawatt compared to Ontario, the province of Ontario, which is 60% nuclear. So, 
so that's that's what we've accomplished so far. For, so there's a there is a lot of potential of of nuclear to avoid greenhouse gas emissions. Next next advantage of nuclear is the habitat footprint. So it uses about 400 times less land per kilowatt than intermittent energy. Um, and you know, for, <laughs> there's one example here is this this map in the top left corner here. There's a tiny little green speck there. Uh, with an arrow, I don't know if you can see it, but that that tiny little green speck, that's a nuclear, that's the size of a nuclear plant needed to provide, uh, gen to uh, uh, produce enough hydrogen to switch over all of UK's uh, oil consumption to hydrogen fuel instead. Uh, and whereas the pink band is the offshore wind area you'd need and the yellow is the solar panel you need. So, so, so the land use, you know, right now, it's not a big deal, but it's going to, as we scale up non-fossil energy, it's going to become a huge, it's going to become a huge deal and a huge threat to habitat. Um, the other, the other problem with wind turbines specifically is that it's estimated and, and these estimates are, are, you know, there's a wide range in estimates because we don't really have systematic data on it yet, but estimated a, a large number of of bats and birds killed each year by, by wind turbines. Um, and we see around the nuclear plants, even around Chernobyl, that you know, wildlife, because there's a tiny little footprint, we can leave all that habitat alone and, and wildlife can flourish. Uh, the last point on, on the habitat impact is the mining. So the, the, the way high technologies is going in the world. We're, we're making a lot of advances. We're discovering a, a lot of uses for rare earths and we're gonna, and we look like we're poised to drive a huge increase in mining of certain kinds of materials and they're starting to prospect in the oceans floor as well. So there's, if, if we're not smart about this, there's a definite threat to habitat, both ocean and land. Um, and, and here again, nuclear may have an important advantage. One is that you see this chart in the top left. It's the lowest material use uh, per uh, uh, kilowatt of electricity generated for any, any of the different sources of energy. And it's uh, the advanced nuclear will be much less, maybe 80% or more reduction in that material use. And then uh, it has no critical materials. So, uh, um, you know, lithium, cobalt, uh, some of these that are, are, are being driven by other technologies that nuclear doesn't use. So, so it may help us as an energy form to avoid some of the, the mining impact. Okay, so, um, so I guess we'll, uh, you know, just to summarize, uh, nuclear in general, it, it's a different heat source. It has hazards that we have protocols to protect. It can generate a lot of en energy with a very small habitat and very small climate impact. So we'll open it up for about 10 minutes here. I think, uh, Steve, are you monitoring the questions? Yeah, yeah. So I'm unmuted now. And so <laughs> I'd, I'd like to start with a question that was raised by Barry Solomon. Uh, regarding um, waste from nuclear mining uh, that isn't discussed much. And there was a response from Alfred Parrish that I wasn't sure actually addressed the question, but makes an, an important point that I want to touch on too. He says, uh, Barry, nuclear waste is recyclable many different ways. In fact, France gets 75% of their electricity from nuclear power and has for 30 years, is able to fit all their nuclear waste in the basement of one building because they recycle it and they can keep doing that many times. When they're finally, when they're finally done, it's trivial to dispose of, just a few fancy rocks that can be dropped in a hole. So one question might be, why isn't the US doing the same thing? And the other question is, why, um, what about the waste from the mining? Because uh, I don't think Alfred really addressed that and that's a a question that um, isn't discussed much. So two questions there really. Okay, um, I'll, I'll make a comment on that. Jim, Jim may want to also. Um, but uh, first of all, as far as the mining waste goes, you, you know, there's, there's a couple different sources of, of, of waste. Um, one is, as I was mentioning, there's an enrichment 
uh, so so the so if we use the fuel cycle that does the enriching of the U-235, then there's a whole bunch of U-238 that's just kind of thrown away. And that's what we call depleted uranium. And they use that for armor. Um, they use it for bullets. Uh, they use it for various things. But there is a huge stockpile of that in the United States. Um, so there's, there is one, uh, one output. Uh, it's radioactive. It's fairly low radioactivity it's not you know it's not real difficult to protect from the radiation of it but the, but there's a lot of that piling up uh, a lot more of that than there is actual nuclear fuel um, and then then there's the nuclear nuclear fuel that's uh, that's spent and that's I believe what Alfred was referring to that that can be reprocessed and recycled and burned again because we're we're just burning a you know a small portion of it which is what France does and some other countries do. Uh, the, I'm not real deep on, on that aspect. Um, we, United States did recycle for a while in the sense of taking bombs, bomb material, some of the US bombs that were deactivated and a large amount of Russian bombs that part of the treaties with Russia that uh, you know closed closed, uh, reduced the nuclear bomb stockpiles and, and the United States did operate a plant to convert that into energy and, and generate electricity for a while. They, they shut that down. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I think the economics, it wasn't, there was no particular money to be made on that. It was cheaper to just put the material somewhere and store it, uh, I believe, but someone, I don't know, Jim, can, do you have any uh, more information on that? Uh, yes, first of all, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Actually, I believe, you know, the, the short answer to that is that in the U.S., um, Jimmy Carter shut down the, the reprocessing program, and I, I believe proliferation concerns were given as a reason. I don't necessarily agree with that, but, you know, the other story behind that is one you just alluded to. It's not yet cost-effective if you're thinking of reprocessing as a source of fuel, you know, it's just cheaper to, you know, mine new uranium fuel. You know, the, the spent fuel is small in volume. It was just easier to store it, you know, and you could choose the direct disposal path. Um, you know, in terms of long-term hazard from waste, I just want to point out is that whether we reprocess or go with once through, you know, the NRC concluded that Yucca Mountain would meet all the impeccable technical requirements. And what those requirements basically mean is that rigorous proof that, you know, not only will nuclear waste be contained, but it will remain contained for as long as it remains hazardous. You know, the, they concluded that Yucca meets that standard. Any, you know, geological repository will meet that standard. So, you know, the point here is that you have to put that in perspective with other energy sources. Frankly, nuclear is the only one that has, a, you know, a viable technical plan to ensure that its wastes never cause significant harm. You know, there's actually no equal in that respect, you know, with other um, energy sources. Um, a separate issue was mining. You know, someone mentioned mining and, you know, wastes from mining. First, I want to, you know, mention, you know, all mines do is they just kind of move stuff around. You know, they're taking stuff that's from the earth, you know, and lifting it out. You mentioned U-238. I mean, I, I suppose we could always just put the U-238 back in. You know, it's not like the U-238 was not there all along. True. But I... <laughs> You know, again, you have to compare it to other energy sources. You know, uh, Kurt talked a lot about the very large mining requirements for, you know, solar and wind. And also you have to consider that, you know, now we have modern uranium mines. A lot of the stories people heard were from these weapons industry mines in the 50s. You know, there were very lax standards and they basically created a big mess that still needs to be cleaned up. But now we have responsible mining activities. And given that fact, I, I believe the truth is that on a per kilowatt hour generated basis, nuclear's mining impacts are, if anything, they're smaller than the fuel extraction impacts for fossil fuels and even for solar and wind. So, you know, again, it's not like other sources don't have mining. You know, all of them, frankly, have mining. And you have to look at the relative impact. You had some slides, you know, showing how if we're really going to power all of our energy with solar and wind, you know, there's going to be a very, very large amount of mining that will. So you have to look at it objectively and, and comparatively. So 
I'm gonna yeah. show, I'm gonna jump in before you um, before Steve asks another question. I was remiss in introducing our speakers. I I'm very sorry about that. I put your your bio in the chat, Kurt, while you were talking, but I just want to make sure that everybody is at least clear on who Jim Hop is. Um, and Jim is a retired senior nuclear engineer with 25 years experience with a bachelor's degree from MIT and a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. And he's been a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby for Modesto chapter for about seven to eight years and leads the CCL nuclear action team. So um, just those of you who didn't see Kurt's bio in the chat, he's a system, Kurt Smith-Peters is a systems engineer and independent researcher living in on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. He's a graduate of Eastern Washington University and the U and University of Washington. And he's worked four decades in aerospace, shipbuilding and metal fabrication um, in locations all around the world. So um, lots of questions for, for you guys. Um, let's see how many we can get through. We don't have a ton of Q&A right, right now. And then we're gonna dive into more specifics, but then keep in mind that if your questions don't get answered in this round, then you can go um, have some some time with um, Jim and Kurt in the in the breakout rooms. So go ahead, Steve. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, there's been a lot of, of great questions and a lot of answers um, in the chat. And I, I urge you all to save the chat um, to look at um, when we're done, because we don't have time to go over all these. One a question related to the waste issue was by Kate Moran. How does that waste amount compare to the other energy production sources? And so this is really a quantitative question. Um, have you seen data on that? Uh, so, go ahead, Kurt. So, yeah. So I just had that one chart that that showed the had some quantities in there. You know, and and the big factor there is that the the currently the the wind turbines and the solar panels are replaced 20 to 25 years or 30 years max whereas a nuclear plant can go way over 100 and and probably as the technology advances will be longer than that so so that's really where a big factor comes in is is not only the amount of of solar and wind collectors but the the you know the the rapidity with which they have to be replaced and then disposed of the material um, I don't have a, 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 a you know, a, a ratio, a, you know, of, of the two, um, but I, I only had that one chart. Okay. Uh, Jim, thank you. Jim, did you want to weigh in? You had your hand up, Jim. Oh, I just said, okay, you know, taking fossil fuels first, if you consider their exhaust product to be waste, you know, that's the pollution and CO2 emitted in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, the volume of nuclear waste per amount of energy generated is somewhere between 10,000 times smaller and 100,000 times smaller. It's a very, very small volume of waste. And, th and that's one of the reasons why nuclear is almost the only source that's actually making an attempt to ensure containment of its, of its waste stream. You know, other energy sources either release it in the environment or just kind of bury it somewhere because it's created in such volume that, you know, it's, it's basically impractical to do anything else. Um, you know, material waste volumes from solar and wind, you know, they're nowhere near as large as fossil fuels, but my understanding is, is that it is a larger waste stream than nuclear's waste stream. Okay, here's a, sort of a general question, but uh, it was intriguing to me from uh, Carl Pauls. What is the relationship between the half-life and the danger of the various isotopes we saw? I think Carl wants to answer that question himself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to chime in though. Um, well, yeah, go ahead, Jim. What is it they say? The star that burns half as bright lasts twice as long. You know, the, the longer the half-life, the less the radioactivity level is. And the ultimate example are, you know, the naturally occurring radioactive elements we have, you know, potassium and bananas, uranium, you know, radon gas. Those are the ones that occur in the environment. You know, they, they have, you know, they're, relatively low activity because they, they've been around for a very long time. Um, so, you know, you hear a lot about people are all afraid of these very long half-life. Certain isotopes have a very long half-life, but the point is, is that they're that much less radioactive. Um, and, and another thing is those same isotopes, generally the transuranic isotopes, they tend to be heavy. They're like metallic or something. And, and the, the basic truth is that they don't tend to migrate. You know, they basically have a tendency to sit where they are. So, the, you know, the, the, 
the fear or the risk of them dispersing significantly is is a lot oftentimes overstated. So, all right. There was a comment from um, Betty Kaderet that um, I think I would like to hear you guys uh, comment on, and that was the U.S. passed the non-proliferation law in the 1970s that bans recycling of fuel. So that's related to that recycling question that. Uh, you know, France does so much. So is that why uh, the U.S. doesn't recycle its fuel? Uh, let's see. You, I'm sorry, you mentioned the non-proliferation treaty? Yeah, probably a treaty. Yeah. Per se, the answer is no, because France recycles and they're, they're a party to the treaty. Oh. England as well. Russia as well, I, I think. Uh, you, you just have to, you know, have controls, proliferation controls. I, I think we just made a political decision that we didn't want to go to that trouble. Actually, I think Jimmy Carter, part of his reasoning was, was that we wanted to set an example. So if we don't reprocess, maybe other nations will, you know, not reprocess. Well, that obviously didn't work out. <laughs> France kept on reprocessing. So did Britain. Um. Hmm. So we um, need to keep moving on as great as the questions are, but keep in mind, we will have more time for questions later in the evening. So I believe, Kurt, you are going to continue talking now about um, X Energy's high temp gas reactor. Okay, great, great. Yeah, and, and before getting into the two specific reactors, uh, I just wanna introduce a little bit about advanced nuclear. Um, first of all, you, you hear about, or you may, if you're <laughs> uh, into this uh, technology, you'll hear about different generations of reactors, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4. So, so basically, Gen 1 is test reactors, uh, and they're continuing to be test reactors. Um, Gen 2 is mainly what's around the world today. Those are pressurized water. So this is not referring to the steam generation to, to run the power plant. Uh, this is referring to water that is mixed into the, the chain reaction, the uranium chain reaction. Uh, it plays both a cooling and a, and a moderating role, which I mentioned earlier about slowing the, the travel of the neutrons, the speed of the neutrons and helping the chain reaction. Uh, that's most plants, that's Gen 2. Gen 3 is the same, same tech pressurized water technology with passive cooling. So Gen 3 is, is designed that without elect electricity, without human intervention, if it overheats or something malfunctions, there's a leak, whatever, uh, passive cooling systems will kick in or will operate automatically in some way. There's different, different uh, configurations of those. That's Gen 3. And there has been, especially since Fukushima, some retrofitting of, of more passive uh, mechanisms into the to the gen 2s but but the gen 3 is is considered safer and and, and uh, able to operate under under more diverse uh, accidents and conditions and then and then gen 4 is the advanced what we're talking about today and and advanced there's a bunch of different technologies there 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 are innovations in the fuel the reaction type the coolant or the size and, and these that we're gonna talk about today are just two of those. There's, there's many others, depending on how you group them, six or 12 uh, significant different types of, of com combining technical innovations. And, and those are more than these two will continue to be developed and, um, and we'll see. We'll see where the greatest benefits are. Um, and then I just want to mention that a particular type of pressurized water is the light water reactor. So that's the common one. That's 80%, 80, 90% of the reactors today are, are light water reactors. It's a flavor of a pressurized water. Uh, onto the two, the two uh, advanced reactors that were contracted to be built. Um, I think Tamara mentioned there's X Energy in Richland, Washington, or Tri Cities, uh, the Hanford uh, Energy Re Re Reservation, and then there's Terra Power, which is Bill Gates' company, and they're they're going to replace one of the coal plants that's going to be retired soon in Wyoming. So uh, they'll they'll plug in, replace the coal heat with nuclear heat, and run the power plant as well as uh, do the other processing that that we'll talk about it in a minute. And they haven't selected, it's one of those four, one of those four plants in Wyoming. 
Um, the other general point is that, you know, this is technology development. There is a lot of promise, but there's a long road to prove it, prove that out. And, and there's actually phases that have to be gone through and developed. And, and at the end of the, the end of the road there is commercialization, something that's commercially viable. Um, but not all these technologies will pan out. Some of these things, it's unforeseen um, where there may be some items that, that just don't work out as intended. Um, and so that's uh, one reason that if, you know, this applies to every energy source, it's not just nuclear, they, they all face they all face difficulties, problems, um, collateral effects that are that are not desired, and so they they have to continuously go through this technology development and become commercialized, and that's one reason that I believe a carbon fee is very important because it creates an objective measurement about whether the direction of technology is actually helping us to achieve our goals or not. Um, and we have a propensity in, in economic activity to go off in tangents because they're convenient or profitable or something. Um, but, and we strain from whatever the objective of that item is. And, that, and that's a very important role of a carbon fee uh, to sustain technology development in the right direction. Okay, enough background. So, so the first one is the one in Richland, um, X Energy's uh, high temperature gas reactor. So, so, so the main, the, the central innovation here is these, is to seal the fuel, the, the radioactive fuel, seal it inside a ceramic tennis ball, essentially. And this, by doing this, this is a very, you know, very durable um, external shell. The fuel products cannot escape during the whole nuclear reaction, the operation of the reactor disposal, they're all locked inside there. Um, so, so one, we've got the safety of, of prevent, as long as that ceramic remains intact, we're not going to get uh, radiation, you know, radiated and going somewhere we don't want it to go. Uh, as well, the, 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 the transfer of the heat to the steam system is done with helium and helium uh, cannot, you know, take in, it will not become radioactive. So the, the helium circulation to the, to the steam system will not uh, export any radiation either. Um, as well, um, uh, another important advantage of this pebble fuel is that um, the, no, no other part of the reactor material or any, any other kind of material that's in the react, reaction area, it never comes in contact with the fuel. And so this is unique to this reactor and every other type of reactor, advanced or not, has some interaction of the fuel with the structural material or other materials that are part of that way the reactor operates and that inevitably causes some wear and, and degradation and corrosion. Uh, now we have strategies to deal with that, but this, this is, uh, prevents some of the, the risk and some of the inefficiencies that can come from, from that corrosion over time. Uh, another part of this is to burn up the, you know, that I mentioned earlier, the pol proliferation attractive isotopes. Uh, the way this is designed to work is to burn those up inside the pebble. Uh, so, so once the pebbles leave the reactor, we're done with them, um, regardless of where they're shipped or stored, uh, there, there's not a significant amount of proliferation attractive material in them. And then the last point, which is really what's intended here is, is the high heat. And they're going through some phases of technical development initially somewhere around 800 degrees centigrade. And, and there's a much higher potential as they you know, experiment and test and develop this, this uh, technology. Okay, so, so one of the most important advantages here is industrial process heat. Um, I've got this little chart in the top left, it shows making things, you know, like material production, cement, steel, plastic, et cetera. That's our highest uh, greenhouse gas generator, 31%, higher than any other single source. Um, right now, there is uh, there's fossil fuel intense for that that heat supply. You know, the the, the manufacturing of the material requires high heat, um, and there is no feasible alternative to fossil fuels today. Um, there is some ways to use electricity, but there's, uh, you know, massive amounts of electricity needed compared to the energy, we, you know, the amount of fossil fuel that's used. 
Um, and this is the big advantage that these these high heat reactors is that they can be uh, they can that 31% can be replaced with nuclear. Um, one other point I wanted to make is that uh, the syn fuel generation or hydrogen generation is another use of, of high heat, high industrial heat. And there's, we'll see all of this, as I said earlier, all this technology needs to be developed and proved out, but there's indications that advanced nuclear would have some significant advantages um, in syn fuel generation. So, so, so two things for hydrogen generation, for example, there's a very expensive electrolyzer material that's required. It's a capital expense. The fact that nuclear can run 100% of the time or 98% of the time means that you're getting the full uh, production of hydrogen for whatever amount of capital you put in to purchase electrolyzer. Um, and that's one, and that makes intermittent energy um, uh, less, you know, economically feasible because you got a lot of downtime and so you have a lot of capital expenditure in the electrolyzer that's not being utilized. Uh, and then the other thing is that because both heat and electricity come out of the uh, advanced reactors, the high heat reactors, then it can support a more efficient type of hydrogen uh, production, which is steam electrolysis. Um, so, so that's an example of, of the type of advantages that, that nuclear heat can bring to these industries. Um, and this is just a diagram uh, showing um, the different types of industrial processes over on the right that could be fed by nuclear heat, um, both, both direct use of heat, uh, uh, use of heat to, to generate steam and electricity, then the use of electricity, and then also the use of the heat and the electricity to uh, generate syn fuels and hydrogen. And then it can feed all these different industries. So it'll be interesting to see with the, uh, I don't, I haven't seen maybe someone in the audience knows that what industries they're going to prove out with the, the X energy reaction in, in Richland. It, it will be interesting to see what, you know, what they demonstrate there. Okay. The other aspect is that it's small. The X energy uh, high temperature gas reactor is small. It's around 80, 80 uh, megawatts output versus a thousand megawatts, which is a you know typical, typical normal reactor size today. Uh, so so quite a bit smaller. Um, now they can be put in modules, but there's some some pros and cons to that size. So so one of the biggest pros is that it can be built in a factory, and you see a, a artist rendition here of, of going by truck. You can go by truck um, or barge to to where it's going to be erected. Um, that factory building is just more stable, more um, consistent than, than field erection at a construction site. It just, it's just inherently that way. So there's better quality, faster, cheaper construction. Um, so that's a big, big uh, advantage. Uh, there is a lot of local power source applications where putting a, a, a small output of electricity can, can um, you know, near to some some site of use is, you know, there's an efficiency in that. Um, and, and probably one of the biggest things here, uh, it's debatable, but is the opportunity to improve safety and reform regulations. So, so the, you know, I would say that the, uh, the radiation theory and, and, and the safety regula construction regulations that derive from that are not a, a, a real valid thorough safety engineering practice and, and, and theory. And the, the opportunity for the, the regulatory authorities to take another look at nuclear with a slightly different situation and able to bring, as they're developing these technologies, put new safety uh, features in and prove those out, um, that's, that's gonna be a big advantage. Um, and in the end, uh, I'll say it's unlikely that if we only had the small ones, we, we would not fully decarbonize energy because the economy is scale. There's, there's just places where we need the big power, big, big metropolis and so on. Um, but the likely, what's likely is this technology development and improved safety um, is gonna feed those techni technology innovations into the big scale late, you know, as another, another phase, another stage of development later. And, and eventually we will have have the big ones um, populated again where we need them.
Uh, just to mention a few other benefits here, um, you know, the load following of intermittent energy. So this, this reactor, the X-Energy reactor in Richland is designed to change 40% of its power in 15 minutes. So if you have abrupt energy change from the sun going down or, or the wind stops blowing on the intermittent energy, this, this can react quickly. And that's a very important uh, necessity of the electricity grid. Um, <clears throat> low operating pressure, um, because they don't have water, they, they don't have a high pressure in the reactor. It's, it's near atmospheric pressure. So that eliminates the need for great big concrete structure um, and uh, also allows them to go with a, so, a smaller safety perimeter, 400 meter power plant safety perimeter is what they're targeting. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. So I think I kind of uh, mentioned the other advantages. Okay, so that was uh, one of them, the one for Richland, X Energy. Um, now the next one is Bill Gates, baby, um, the natrium sodium fast reactor. As I mentioned, this is gonna be targeted in Wyoming. So, so what, what this, what TerraPower is the name of the company, what they're targeting is to burn up various fuel supplies with using this sodium fast reactor technology. Uh, I mentioned depleted uranium. You know, they've estimated that there's centuries of U.S. electricity just in the de depleted uranium stores alone in the United States. Um, but there's also the spent fuel. There's bombs that you know are being converted. Um, there's non-fissile materials. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, radioactive material, but it's not in a condition that can. Uh, maintain a chain reaction in today's technology of reactors, but this technology reactor can burn them. Um, now that's called a fast reactor, which I mentioned earlier, that, that's been around for a while. We've known about that and we have some, you know, a few of those operating in the world. Uh, it uses metal fuel rods, which there's kind of a picture there in the middle of the metal fuel rods and they're in a sodium, a molten, you know, melted sodium uh, coolant. Now that technology has been around. There's a submarine that had that and, and there's been several operating versions that have operated for decades of relatively proven out. The innovation that they're seeking with this reactor is that they will be able to do a once through cycle that they will, they will put these different uh, types of <clears throat> fuel sources <clears throat> that, you know, the, the depleted uranium, the spent fuel and so on. They're gonna arrange it in these rods and they're gonna be able to convert that to use the fast neutrons to convert that to splittable, fissionable material and burn it all up in the rods without ever post-processing. Um, and that's really not been done on any, any sort of scale yet. So that's, that's a future technology that, that, that they're aiming for. And one of the main idea, one of the big advantages of this is to uh, really take away the ability of pr proliferation. Um, most of these materials that they were use are not in their, in their natural, in the state that they come to the reactor, they're, they're not the type of isotopes that could be used for bombs anyway. And then they're gonna be uh, converted, but then fully burned in the reactor. So there's, once they come out of the reactor, they're not, uh, there's no more proliferation attractive material in there. So um, that's what they're seeking now, as say that's an advanced technology and they've got a, a plan to go step by step. Um, at the start, they talk about a 30% um, uh, more energy per fuel, but at that further stage when they perfect this technology and, and they start to use the uh, recycled fuel and, and recycled depleted uranium, they're looking at 30 times more energy per fuel than current reactors. So, so a big increase in efficiency. Um, now this kind of gets back to the mining question, just kind of illustrates the, the material differences between today's technology um, and, and what these advanced, the fast reactors can do. Um, and this, this is kind of an extreme case of thorium where you can get the, the most um, burn out of a material, but, but the same principle applies to uranium as well. So you see on this top picture on the left is, is today's 
light water reactors, the, the process they go through, they, they've got to mine all that 250 tons out of there, um, but they only get uh, 35 tons uh, is able to be used. And out of that, only a, you know, a small percent of that is, is actually the 235 that, uh, that you know, is, is generating the fuel. So, so you've got a lot of mining, a lot of material flow um, for a, a pretty small energy usage. Um, and they're, of the material that gets into the reactor, they're only burning three to 5% of it. Um, and that's why they talk about recycling and reprocessing, right? Um, if you look at the bottom, you know, you take a uh, thorium, which is not splittable in its natural form, but you put it into a fast reactor, it converts it to a splittable, fissionable material and burns it. And, you know, so you've got, uh, and you don't have all that, that extra material processing. So, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of advantage to be gained here. Now, the, the natrium, sodium, uh, a fast reactor could be configured towards, you know, a very efficient operation like this. But what there's a bit of a trade off that they're seeking They're they're wanting to use the more proven metal fuel and sodium coolant and uh, eliminate the multiple processing to just have a once through. Uh, so, th so they won't have quite the uh, material savings, but they'll have a lot of material savings and uh, uh, use a more proven technology. These, these, the, the thorium is going to take a little more research to get there. The other thing is the load following. Um, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the same technology that's used in some of the uh, concentrated solar solar heating facilities where the, you know, they concentrate the sun with mirrors and, and they heat up uh, molten salt and store it and then use that for energy generation. Um, to, to, to balance this, the sun's intermittency. Uh, same idea they're going to employ with this reactor so that the reactor can run at a relatively steady state and it's building up, uh, uh, it heats up, the, the heat is transferred to the, the molten salt and it's stored in, in big tanks. And then depending on the electricity demand, they're going to run more or less of that heated salt into the steam cycle, generate the steam and create the electricity. So, so this is a very rapid uh, power swing and a large amount of power. You can see it can, it can swing from, uh, you know, it's steady state of three maximum is like 350 megawatts, but it can, with that stored energy, it can peak out the steam generation at, at 500 megawatts for I think something like five hours. But anyway, so this is a, another advantage of this, this, this uh, technology is to, to load follow. And that means we can use more intermittent sources without uh, disrupting the grid. OK, and just to kind of summarize some of the advantages of the sodium fast reactor, uh, it's got the high heat. Um, and uh, so, so the industrial process and, and those types of things that we talked about earlier, those advantages it can bring. It uh, doesn't have water inside, so it can be a low, inside the reactor, it can be a low operating pr pressure. They've estimated, TerraPower's estimated they'll reduce the containment building concrete by 80%. Um, and, and, and I would expect a smaller, a smaller uh, evacuation zone around it. Uh, simpler, cheaper, faster to, to build the components when you don't have, have everything beefy for, the, for that high, high water pressure. Um, is designed for passive heat removal. And this is kind of an advantage of sodium that sodium has as a natural convection that will, that will uh, the, the, you know, the, the sodium will circulate and convect the heat and passively on its own and, and radiate it if you've got something around it to take the heat. And what they do is they put an air, air jacket around it, which is also naturally fed. So there's natural convection through the air, air jacket around the sodium and it's able to, if there is, something wrong, something overheats, that this system is designed to remove the heat safely. So at a, at a rate that it won't cause an explosion. There's, a, there's not a, a superheating that caused an explosion of some material. Uh, and then they have some other, other safety and the, and the reaction itself, uh, it has a self-regulating -re um, um, characteristic that if it starts to overheat, it'll slow the reaction down. Okay, last last slide. Um, so, so um, 
we've got a situation that that we've we've actually been here before. Um, back in the in the 1950s, uh, you know, in the in the heat of the of the Cold War, um, Eisenhower launched the Atoms for Peace campaign. Uh, it was a situation where most of the world did not have electricity. Um, and it was, uh, you know, this was to the chagrin of the Cold Warriors, but, but it was actually applauded worldwide, this initiative. Um, I got a picture on the left, they actually went and took, took the nuclear power plant pieces in their, in their suitcases and went to Geneva for, a, 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 you know, an international meeting on, on peaceful energy and, and built a reactor there for everybody to watch. Um, so yeah, it was a noble noble cause, it ultimately failed to commercialize. In the situation we're in today, they're still one third or energy poor. They're, they're collecting biomass to cook their food and, and heat, their, heat their dwellings. Uh, and plus everybody else needs to decarbonize. So, so we've got an even bigger imperative now for energy. And again, I believe commercialization will be decisive. So, so we really need to find the ways to, to push through the technical development and, and, and prove out the, the safe sources that we need. Um, and I just want to end this with a quote from Bill Gates, because I think it, 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 it makes a, a, an important observation. Um, so I'm just gonna read it. Uh, Where the revenue from this carbon price goes is not as important as the market signals sent by the price itself. We need policies that drive the markets toward clean energy products to lower the green premiums. It's the only way to make it easier for middle and low income countries to reduce their emissions. Lowering the green premiums that the world pays is an opportunity to make scientific breakthroughs that will give birth to new industries composed of major new companies, creating jobs and reducing emissions at the same time. So, so the point is that there, there's a virtuous circle that we can that's out there, that's a potential. If we, if we keep the technology development going, we can, we can achieve a reduction of emissions, uh, creation of jobs, you know, and a, and a worldwide transition. Um, so, all right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Kurt, for um, all that you have shared with us so far. Um, we do now get to hear from Jim, and he is going to talk to us about nuclear power, carbon pricing, and CCL. So that was a beautiful segue. Kurt, go ahead and stop your screen share, and Jim is going to pull up his slides. So we are um, a bit behind in our schedule. I just wanted to mention that. So we're going to be going probably until, uh, let me just do some math here, very likely until the top of the hour um, when we will stop, start our optional breakout room discussions. So um, take it away, Jim. Okay. Hello, Jim Hoff. I'm a as Tom, Tom Rowe mentioned, I'm a, a retired nuclear engineer, a CCL member for seven or eight years, uh, California chapter, and I'm also the leader of a nuclear action team that's been formed within CCL recently. Um, what I'm going to talk about is two things, um, nuclear's economic situation right now and how that situation might be affected by carbon pricing or other energy policies that are being discussed. Um, I'm going to start with existing nuclear plants and then also touch on new nuclear power economics um, in that regard. And then in the second half of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the CCL Nuclear Energy Action Team, what it's all about, and direct people on how to find it on the CCL website if they're interested in joining. Um, okay, the, basically the, the current situation with existing nuclear power plants is that many of them are struggling to compete and are being threatened with closure. The reason for that is twofold. One is that in many states, there are fairly large subsidies and mandates for renewable energy. But it, probably a bigger factor is the, you may have heard of the shale gas revolution. Uh, you know, gas has grown very cheap. And in a lot, a lot of parts of the country, not only is gas cheap, but gas plants, you know, they get to emit pollution and CO2 into the environment for free. Whereas with nuclear, you know, unlike renewables, nuclear gets zero credit at all financially, you know, for the fact that it doesn't emit pollution or CO2. So there's kind of a growing awareness that, you know, something's gonna probably be need to, do, need to be done to prevent a large number of nuclear plants closing. Because if they do, um, that'll set 
nationwide, you know, our climate efforts backwards by a great deal. You know, it, it threatens to offset much of the progress we're making with renewables. The idea being that if we want to make progress with global warming, we need to have renewables replace fossil fuels as opposed to another non-emitting source like nuclear. So, so it is a serious problem. Um, and before talking about the economics of nu existing nuclear, one thing has to be you know, made clear. There are two types of energy market in the United States. There's what's called the regulated market and the merchant market or free market market. Uh, in the regulated market, nuclear power plants, basically, as long as they convince the PUC that, you know, they're, they're trying to do their best to keep rates low, the PUC allows the nuclear plant to recover all its costs, plus a fixed profit margin. So, first of all, nuclear plants in those sections of the country are not in as much trouble. As you can see from the map here, the gray zone is the regulated market. There are relatively few plants that are under threat of closure. And you know, in terms of how energy policies would affect nuclear plants in regulated markets, it's actually kind of complicated. It's not cut and dry how it affects their economics. Um, you know, again, they're kind of covered by the rate-based program where they basically get to cover all their costs. Now in the merchant market, you know, you have a free market among electricity generators and they basically all compete to provide power. And the kind of the way it works is that starting from the lowest bidder to the highest bidder, in other words, the, the power plants with the lowest operating cost to the highest operating cost, the last guy who's necessary to meet the level of demand at that time, that sets the market price for all the generators that are, that win, you know, win the right to, uh, be turned on and you know contribute supply so if you're significantly lower than that last you know most expensive supplier you get to make a profit if you're higher than that you you actually don't get to generate electricity at all or what a lot of nuclear plants do in these markets because it's really bad for them to shut down what they do is they actually lose money you know they they still say yes i'm going to provide power but i'm going to provide it at a loss so that's really the cause of the problem as you can see, the, the uh, merchant market or free markets for electricity, the yellow parts of this plot, that's where most of the plants shown in red, these triangles, that's where most of the plants that are facing the threat of shutdown, that's where most of them exist. So here's a, here's, this slide kind of shows the economic situation for these merchant electricity markets. On the left, what we have, is kind of the total operating cost, going forward cost for a multi-unit nuclear facility on average and a smaller single unit facility. The costs are higher for the single unit facility for a couple of reasons. You know, with a multi-unit site, you can share costs and there's just a general economy of scale. So, you know, the larger multi-unit plants are a bit more economical. If you look on the right side of the plot, this shows kind of the individual markets that are in that those yellow sections that I showed on my on my previous slide. Like, you know, we have Texas is right here. This thing called the PJM that kind of extends from Illinois through, you know, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. And, you know, that's where most of the yellow is on this this, you know, map here. And that's where most of the nuclear plants are and where many of the ones that were threatened with closure are. Basically, so if you look at the right side of the plot here, it basically shows that it's about $30 a megawatt hour in most of these markets. Um, in other words, that translates into three cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the problem is, if you look back on the left, you know, most nuclear, a lot of these nuclear plants, they are a little bit higher than that. Not much, but a little bit, you know, maybe $5 a megawatt hour or so. It's a worse situation for the smaller single unit plants. They might be as much as 50. So as you can see, that would be, you know, they're $20 per megawatt hour higher than what they can get in the market. So, you know, plants that are in that situation, if they haven't already closed, they're, they're you know, in a very um, bad position right now. So I'll, I'll just, you know, cut, I'll preemptively talk about carbon pricing. You know, what $10 a megawatt hour, let, let me, let's see, $10 a megawatt hour corresponds to a carbon price 
of about $20 per ton, assuming that it's gas, natural gas, that these nuclear plants have to compete with. And that's basically the case. That's what they're competing with, or perhaps you should say failing to compete with. So if you have a $20 um, carbon price, what that would do is it would raise the cost of gas generation by about $10 a megawatt hour. So let's say in most of these bar charts on the right, that would increase it from around 30 to 40. And those natural gas plants are what sets the market price. So the market price for electricity will go up by about $10 a megawatt hour. And all of these multi-unit plants, uh, you know, that are shown on the left, they would no longer be under threat of closure. On the other hand, you know, kind of a worst case scenario, if you looked at this MISO, that's kind of like um, Iowa, you know, it's kind of like the Great Plains area, it's only $23. Some of these plants are uh, almost $25 higher than that. So you would need a carbon price of closer to 50, okay, in order to make those plants profitable. So keep that in mind because I'm about to talk about uh, carbon pricing and how it would affect the economic situation of existing nuclear plants in these merchant markets in the United States. Um, okay, we're gonna talk carbon pricing first, one example of which is carbon fee and dividend. That's the policy that we support. If you run the numbers, it basically makes all of the existing nuclear plants in the United States profitable after anywhere from one to four years. Um, earlier, I mentioned that the large plants, I'll go back, you know, these large plants on the left, they're only like five, five or $10 a megawatt hour, you know, too expensive. So you only need like a $10 per megawatt hour increase in order to make that happen. That corresponds to like 15 to $20 um, dollars per ton of CO2. And as many of you may know, that's what our policy does in the very first year. So seriously, like one or two years, all the nuclear, almost all the nuclear plants in the United States would be profitable. I mentioned earlier that kind of the very smallest plants in the very worst markets, I'm not even sure how many of these there are, even in that worst case scenario, after four years, you know, our policy, what is that, 60, 55, $55 a ton, that'll be enough to make even those nuclear plants profitable. So carbon pricing, our, our policy and specifically is just like a holy grail policy for, for existing nuclear power plants. It would frankly solve all of its problems after a very short period of time. Okay, let's talk about new nuclear. Now, as you know, as you, a lot of you have heard, at the moment at least, uh, new nuclear is very expensive to build. We do have hopes that some of these new reactor concepts or designs will eventually provide lower cost. Of course, the counter theory to that is that first of a kind plants are you know, always a lot more expensive than you know after you get good at building them so you know the first few of these new reactor designs they're probably going to be you know expensive as well however it's also true that most of these new nuclear plant ideas they're, they're probably not going to be deployed until like maybe 10 years you know from now and if, if you take our policy and go out 10 years that's a carbon price of 100 and what is it 100 115 dollars a ton which is like over 50 dollars a megawatt hour um there's a good chance that it will be enough you know for new nuclear as well at the time that they're actually going to enter the market that they will be competitive as well i should also point out that as the carbon price gets really high it's going to force us to move towards an all non-emitting grid and right now, expert opinion is that due to intermittency problems and the, you know, the dramatic cost of storage that would be required, you know, as you try to get most or all of your power from intermittent sources, the cost of the necessary storage goes up exponentially. And the reason for that is, you know, instead of storing power for a few hours or maybe a day, if, you're, if you really want a high penetration level of intermittent sources, you have to store power for months or seasons. And you know the cost of that amount of storage is so high that even if nuclear had a high construction cost, it would still make economic sense to add new nuclear into the mix. It would actually result in a lower overall cost. So the bottom line is that even in the near term, carbon fee and dividend will stop nuclear plant closures in the United States. 
or at least for economic reasons. But further on down the road, like 10 years from now, 15 years from now, um, our, our policy, our carbon pricing policy will make it attractive to build new nuclear power plants as well, even if you know, we believe kind of the pessimistic assumptions as far as how much they will cost. Okay, I'm gonna move on to some of the other policies that are being discussed. Probably the main one right now is the clean energy standard. That's being discussed by you know, the Biden administration. And, and to be quite honest, I hate to be negative here, but it's kind of has the pole position right now in terms of energy policy. CCL is trying to get change that and you know, have carbon price be given more attention. But right now that's kind of what everyone's talking about. Basically the way a clean energy standard works is that it's a revenue neutral cap and trade policy basically for the power sector only. Kind of like cap and trade, they're basically saying that the entire power sector by 2035 needs to be entirely emissions free. And it, like cap and trade, it kind of works with permits, you know, trading permits. If, if I have a non-emitting source, I, I'm given permits and I can trade those to, you know, fossil fuel generators that are still emitting, but the amount of permits goes down, you know, as time goes on. And eventually the point is, is that it's forcing the fraction from non-sequestered fossil to go down, down steadily with time until 2035, when you basically required to have no, you know, no fossil fuel generation at all, unless they have carbon capture. Now, the reasons get a little bit subtle here, but uh, the, car, the clean energy standard is likely at least a little bit worse for existing nuclear than our carbon pricing policy. And I'm, I'm gonna try to explain this as briefly as I can. Um, with carbon pricing, the financial advantage that nuclear gets over fossil generation is fixed and it increases along a fixed timeline. But unfortunately with the policies like a clean energy standard, if you have other policies in there like you know, heavy subsidies for renewables and so on and so forth, what that does is that because those other policies allow you to meet the, cap, the CES goal easier, what it does is it tends to cause the, the credit prices, I'm using cap and trade terms, the, the financial advantage that nuclear would get over gas, it causes that to go down because of the presence of those other policies. Whereas carbon pricing is not affected as much by the presence of other policies. It, you know, if you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to talk to me in the breakout session, or maybe I could talk to you via email, because this is a little bit subtle, it's kind of hard to understand. We have observed this before, you know, in both Europe and California, they had a cap and trade system alongside other policies that, you know, very dramatically supported solar and wind. And what you saw in both of those markets is that the emissions credit prices associated with the cap and trade program languished at very low levels, you know, like single dollars, single digit dollars per ton, far too low to make any significant difference. So in Europe and in California, you know, nuclear got no help very little help from the cap and trade program. And the reason is, is that the cap and trade program was undermined by the presence of these tech specific subsidies and CE, the clean energy standard will suffer from the same thing. Now for new nuclear, it's a little bit of a better story. Um, the point is, is that as we go further along from the mid to long term, and there's very little fossil fuel allowed, some of the effects that I was just talking about earlier won't be as important. You know, you know the, the credit prices under the CES will still, even if there are new, uh, renewable subsidies on the side, they will still raise to high levels and they should be high enough to help nuclear, new nuclear at the time it's actually deployed. Um, and also, oh, I'm sorry, there's something I forgot to mention. Um, in a lot of the energy policies being considered by the administration and in Congress, including you know, the Biden plan, the clean energy standard. They're proposing extending the renewable subsidies, but new nuclear, not existing nuclear, new nuclear will probably get similar subsidies than to those that are given to solar and wind. So in that sense, the entire issue is not there, whereas it is there for new nuclear because, I'm sorry, for existing nuclear, because they aren't gonna get, you know, those tech specific subsidies. There is one final wrinkle though, that's kind of a cause for concern. 
as you may have heard, the Biden plan for the clean energy standards is they're going to require that the grid be entirely fossil free by 2035. And the, the concerning point for new nuclear is that, you know, a lot of these new nuclear technologies that have been discussed tonight, they might not be ready for large scale deployment before 2035. So, you know, you're wondering, is, is the entire market going to be given to other sources before nuclear even has a chance to step in and compete? So the, the, the early timeline when it's required to reach zero carbon is potentially troubling. Okay, just one more slide. I'm gonna talk about some of the other policies that are out there. There are some policies at the federal level where they're actually proposing to provide some subsidies for existing nuclear plants to help them stay open. As I said, this is a growing concern. There, there seems to be a growing political consensus, fortunately, that we should keep these plants open. The American Nuclear Infrastructure Act would provide existing plants, you know, they'll be able to apply for just enough support for them to basically break even. By the way, the that act also has other aspects that support R&D and streamline licensing for new plants. There's another bill out there that's been recently introduced called the Clean Energy for America Act. Existing nuclear plants would get $15 per megawatt hour of support, but only when market prices are under $25 per megawatt hour. That seems a little problematic because a lot of these plants need more than $25 per megawatt hour, but the way it actually works is it's kind of, it, it applies at any moment in time. And what's really going on with a lot of these plants is that a lot of time the market price is over what they need, but there are some times when the market prices are really low. And what this would do at least is top that up, you know, those times of either negative market price or very low market price, it, it would top that up to $25 a megawatt hour. That might be enough help to, to allow these plants to get by. However, you know, I, I, I have to still say that, you know, we're not at a point, they talk, there's a lot of talk about tech neutrality, but we're not at the point where nuclear really is, you know, given the same level of help as you know, renewables like solar and wind. One example is the Biden 10-year budget plan. They're planning on spending $265 billion for extended or expanded renewable energy credits. Whereas that same plan, it only gives $10 billion to help keep existing nuclear plants open. And, and when you look at the numbers, it's not even clear that that will be enough to save all of them. One question is, and I've studied this, I've looked at all these articles and bills, and I actually haven't been able to quite figure this out. When they say Biden will spend 265 billion for quote unquote renewable energy credits, it's not clear whether new nuclear would you know, be um, qualified to, or get some of that 265 billion. So that, that's actually a question mark. Uh, there's also another bill out there um, proposed by Oregon Senator Wyden Again, they keep talking about how, you know, it's technology neutral, technology neutral, and they're gonna spend about 260 billion over 10 years. So I'm, I'm a little less clear on the details of that bill, you know, whether they will truly treat new nuclear and, new, and renewables the same, I'm not quite sure. Okay, now I'm on to the second part of my talk. Uh, this is about the newly formed CCL nuclear action team and what it's about. Um, if you find it on the website, and I'm going to tell you how to do that momentarily, you'll see our objectives on the front page of the action team. That's what you'll see. On the left side of the slide, though, I provided just a very brief um, uh, description of what we're about. As Tamara said earlier, or Tamara, you know, nuclear uh, CCL is assiduously agnostic about nuclear. You know, they support carbon pricing a technology neutral policy, but the, you know, they don't support or oppose any specific energy options. Um, and the same is true with the Nuclear Energy Action Team. It is not a pro-nuclear group within CCL that's trying to convince you know, CCL to support nuclear power. It's almost kind of, it's closer to the truth to say it's, it's sort of the opposite. Instead, what we're trying, what we're all about is getting the nuclear industry to support carbon pricing. Um, in terms of our three main objectives, that's actually our first objective is to gain nu nuclear industry support for carbon pricing. You know, the way we do that is we have lobby meetings with uh, various nuclear companies to try to get them on board carbon pricing. That might be 
a public endorsement of our bill, but it can include other things as well. You know, a lot of times these nuclear companies, they actually lobby Congress themselves. So, you know, we, we're trying to convince them to lobby Congress in support of carbon pricing. The second main objective of the action team is to advise CCL members and chapters on how to talk to pro-nuclear legislators. You know, almost regardless of how you feel about nuclear power, you know, CCL training says that we should find whatever arguments work, you know, for a given legislator to get them to support carbon pricing. You know, whatever arguments work, you know, and whatever they're, if they're pro-nuclear, if we use the nuclear angle and point out that carbon pricing will help, help nuclear, that would make them a lot more likely to support our policy. So we've actually put out a guidance document and I've actually forwarded this, this guidance document to the people running this event, as well as the local chapters there in Washington. And if you wanna get a copy, you know, they would be happy to forward it to you. Um, Basically, you know, it, it's a document advising CCL members and chapters. When you meet with a pro-nuclear legislator, these are the sort of talking points, you know, that you should use. These are kind of the sort of things you should say to maximize your chance of getting them to support carbon price using nuclear related arguments. And finally, the third objective of our action team is it's basically a gathering place for nuclear experts within CCL. And that can be a source of nuclear expectations expertise that CCL can use. You know, there's basically a place to hang our shingle on the CCL community website. So if CCL members have questions about nuclear, whether they want to understand nuclear in general or, or want to understand how to talk, you know, to legislators about it, they know where we are. I've actually had, you know, several chapter leaders or members uh, actually approach us or me asking for advice. So that, that's the third function uh, of the action team. So one final thing I'm gonna go over, if CCL members would like to um, learn more about the team or join the team, the, I'll tell you how to do it. The first step is you go to the CCL community website. That's basically our members only website. When you log on, you should see a, a dashboard page like this. Um, in the top bar, you'll see a connect tab. It's circled there in red. You click on that, when you click on that, this pull down menu comes down. One of the entries on the pull down men menu is action teams. It's on the left. You should see that highlighted in red. You click on that. When you do that, it brings up the action team directory. It shows this large list of all the CCL action teams. The nuclear energy action teams is on the left column there in the business and labor section. You click on that thing that's uh, circled in red. And when you do that, our, our front page will come up. In the left column, you see, you know, we, we have a forums where people can post, make posts and have discussions. There's a members list. But in the blue band on the top, in that green part, just to the left, where you see the red highlighting, there will be a join button. If you want to join, just click on it. And, and that's all you have to do. So at this point, I'll entertain questions about either nuclear economics or the nuclear energy action team within CCL. Steve, there are a few questions in the chat that you can go ahead and read to Jim if you're so if you're willing. Don't forget to unmute yourself, Steve. Yeah, lots of discussion here. Uh, that was all really good, both of you. Um, question for Jim Hoff from Carl Pauls. Um, we've heard from Energy Northwest CEO Brad Sawatsky that the Washington State Clean Energy Standard is what really cemented Richland's DOE land as a perfect site to compete with fossil fuels. What are the chances we could do this with public power in Tennessee? Are there other states with DOE property where a carbon price would attract federal cost sharing and publicly owned not-for-profit infrastructure? I just want to be clear, a federal price on carbon? Um, presumably, uh, that's okay. a federal, federal carbon price, yeah. Okay. First, I'm going to go up to my first slide just to verify some. Okay. Tennessee is in the, is in the regulated market. So when nuclear plants are built, 
if they get permission from the PUC, they get to charge for their costs, plus a fixed profit margin. It's not quite like the merchant markets, but the problem is it's kind of hard to convince the PUC right now that that would be the most prudent, you know, cost-effective option. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of the same in a, in a way. If we had a carbon price, you know, it would make nuclear obviously much more competitive versus fossil generation, be it gas generation or, or even coal. They still have some coal in the area, although I, I'm pretty sure they're planning on phasing it out relatively quickly. So, you know, the competitor would be gas. A carbon price can only help in terms of, you know, convincing the PUC that, you know, this new nuclear project is viable and will deliver, you know, close to the lowest cost, you know, for the rate payer. Um, that's basically my level of understanding concerning, you know, the, the intersection between climate policy and regulated power markets. Um, I believe it would help make the case for, uh, you know, a, an advanced reactor project in, in Tennessee. If we had a significant carbon price that they know is going to be growing rapidly, um, unless solar and wind along with massive battery storage would be clearly cheaper. And, and frankly, it's kind of unlikely to happen. I, I think they would be much better able to make the case that, you know, to get the PUC to agree to that project. I just want to clarify that Carl, Carl was referring to Washington state with its state law. So I don't know if there's anything that you might add knowing that, Jim. I got confused. I thought Steve ref made reference to Tennessee. Yeah, right. That's true. He did. But I think that there was an initial question about um, the having heard from the Energy Northwest CEO that the Washington state clean energy standard is what really cemented it. So it's sort of a, it is complicated and um... okay, sorry okay in, in yes in you know a clean energy standard or even a cap and trade program especially over the longer term as I was kind of saying earlier it's going to require you to get near zero so you know then the competition becomes you know renewables and very large scale storage versus a new nuclear project or keeping an existing nuclear plant open. And I'll just say this, it makes it much better for nuclear than it otherwise would have been. Um, Washington state, because of all the hydro, you know, it, it's possible that, you know, those dams could provide backup to intermittent renewables better than most other regions of the country. Um, as you may well know, traditionally, isn't it true that in the Pacific Northwest, power prices have been traditionally very low? Yeah, yeah. So that might make it a bit harder. Um, I, I, I believe that Washington's new energy policy will certainly make it that Columbia will stay open, but um, I'm not sure with respect to uh, new nuclear. There's a, a good question from Derek Smith. In the presence of abundant yet intermittent energy sources, presumably wind and solar, must uh, new nuclear power plants be built smaller and paired with thermal storage for deferred sale of energy at peak prices to maximize profit? That can be a very complicated question. I think my answer is, I think so. Um, here, here's kind of what I know. As long as the penetration levels are fairly low, you know, we've reached a point where solar and wind, even if you include a few hours of storage and at low penetration levels, that's all you need. It's become very competitive and it's going to be a hard sell for new nuclear, you know, to, to compete with that. However, in the longer term, when you can't use natural gas anymore, you know, to back up the intermittent renewables, you, you start having to pay for very large scale storage. And it's a lot less clear, you know, whether renewables with the level of storage required would actually be cheaper than new nuclear. In fact, most experts, there's one renowned expert, you know, Jesse Jenkins, who's known to be very objective. You know, he's not any pro-nuclear, anti-renewable guy, you know, he's very well respected. But their analysis showed that 
a mixture of nuclear and renewables will be cheaper than an all renewable grid because it would require a lot less storage. So they're predicting that there will probably be a, a role for new nuclear. And um, however, getting back to his specific question, Storage is the problem in this. We're trying to have this, you know, all non-carbon grid storage, as I already mentioned, is the problem. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to have sources that can either, you know, back up the intermittent renewables, whether it's battery storage, but um, nuclear plants that can load follow would be another example. So if you can make a reactor that can either load follow or perhaps better yet do other things during the low demand times like maybe a lot of people are talking about a nuclear plant that could switch from power production to you know hydrogen production or some other you know industrial process heat applications um that's another idea out there you know because you know nuclear is capital intensive you want to get the most out of that asset you know one thing that people didn't really understand is like it's kind of never really been a technical problem you know with nuclear load following it was more of an economic problem because nuclear's costs are almost fixed whether you're producing power or not you know a, a nuclear plant that runs half the time literally the power cost is twice as much you know that that's the real barrier um i'll share one more thing analyses show that the amount of storage there's been a lot of talk about how you know inflexible nuclear and intermittent renewables don't get along on the grid. But the truth is, is that the amount of storage required to allow nuclear and renewables to get along on the grid is a lot lower than the amount of storage required for an all, nuclear, uh, an all renewable grid. Because more renewables get along with existing renewables even worse. <laughs> okay, so, so if we have a totally carbon constrained grid, short-term storage will play a role in helping nuclear get along on the grid with renewables. In other words, it won't have to throttle back nearly as often. But another thing that will help is if you can switch a reactor to other modes of operation, that would really help. And, and it is true, that's one area where some of these new reactor concepts might have a larger ability to do that. Some of them are higher temperature, you know, that's great for industrial process heat applications or hydrogen generation. Uh, that HTGR that, you know, was talked about, I, I, I would almost envision that, you know, switching between, you know, industrial process heat and hydrogen or power, you, you know, depending on the demand. Great, thanks, Jim. So in the interest of time, um, I am going to transition us from the educational presentation aspect of our um, evening and just um, wrap that aspect up by just sending a huge thank you to Jim and Kurt for all the preparation as well as the support team for making this event possible this evening. Sarah, Kate and Steve for coming up with the idea, I believe. So, and to each of you for being here this evening.